Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights Podcast. Today, we're talking about lust, which tends to get a bad rep throughout history in literature and pop culture. I mean, it's quite literally presented as the second circle of hell in Dante's Inferno, but times are modern and we're here to reframe that perspective and embrace this innate part of being a human and that sexual desire. And to guide us through this conversation of sex positivity, we're speaking to sex and relationships therapist, Dr. Claude. Claudia Six, currently based in San Rafael, California. Claudia has a PhD in clinical sexology and has a book to her name, Erotic Integrity, which has garnered stellar reviews. Hi, Claudia. Thank you for joining us on the show. How are you going? Hi, Marie. My pleasure. Happy to (laughs) be here. That's great to hear. I'm so happy you're here as well. Uh, Now, I'm aware that you hail from France and you grew up in a culture that's comfortable with sexuality, but how did you know that sexology was something you wanted to pursue academically and throughout your career? When I was a young child, my parents, probably trying to avoid an awkward conversation, decided that in terms of the birds and the bees, they were going to wait until I asked questions. And apparently by the age of five, I had asked all the questions because I knew everything except about the clitoris. And as a teenager, I was a late bloomer, but my friends were all sexually active and I was the one dispensing advice. I was the one saying, make sure you're on birth control. Don't do anything you don't want to do. Make sure you're also getting your rocks off and it's not just for him. And since I grew up in Paris, you know, I would go on the metro and I would see transgender people and sex workers and um, homosexuals. And they were just part of the human landscape. It wasn't a big deal, but the child in me knew that something was different about these people. And, and, but there was no charge about it. So this was just sort of part of my cultural landscape. And then I was in college and I had a friend who was having a lot of relationship trouble and we would spend a lot of time on the phone. And one day she said, God, Claudia, you always say the, say the right thing. You always make me feel so much better. You should be a sex therapist. And we both chuckled and I hung up the phone and I thought, hmm. Um, and then I was, I was a water ski instructor for Club Med and in the Caribbean. And then I was a ski bomb in Aspen, Colorado for a couple of years. And then it just all just kind of came to me in the space of a week. And I thought, you know, I want to be a sex therapist. So I left my footloose and fancy free um, sporty lifestyle and I went back to college and I finished a degree in geography. And I did psychology prerequisites. I got a master's degree in psychology and then I got a PhD in clinical sexology. So that's sort of the medium length version of, I just was aware that it was how I saw the world. It was my lens. And I always say, you know, shoe salesmen notice people's shoes and hairdressers notice people's hair. I've always noticed people's sexuality and eroticism and the ways that it shows up. 
and the ways that people suppress it or don't talk about it. And being French and coming from a culture where people, there wasn't this American puritanical taboo about it, I was comfortable talking about it. And people came to me for advice about it. And that's kind of how, how I became a sex therapist. That's a fascinating story, and it really does sound like this is your calling. Um, so that's incredible, and thank you for sharing that story with us. Now, before we go further into detail, we'd love to get to know you a bit better. This is Have You Met Claudia Six? Now, my first question for you is, what do you like to do in your spare time? In my spare time, I have, I'm a single mom. I have a young son, so I don't have a whole lot of spare time. I exercise every day. Um, I can, I do boot camp, I swim, I do hot Pilates, I do something called X-Core, I'm not advertising for them, I ride my mountain bike, so I do different things, and I study my craft, I really am curious and motivated about personal growth and understanding why people do what they do, and cultivating the skill of sex therapy and studying. So I read a lot of psychology and personal growth and sex therapy books. And I read novels. And I see my friend. Yeah, I see my friends and I, you know, I socialize and yeah. That's already way more than I do in my spare time and I'm not a single mom. (laughs) Um, So you mentioned that you like reading novels. What is a favorite genre of yours? I like kind of character development novels. I will say I only read French novels Mm -hmm. largely to keep up my French. Um, there's sort of the subtleties of language that you lose when you leave your native country. And I find that reading French novels and watching French movies and French TV shows and French documentaries um, helps me maintain my, my fluency, the subtleties of fluency. Yeah. Um, I've never really gotten into French literature, but it's always intrigued me. What is a novel that you'd recommend to anyone who wants to start going into this a bit more? Well, I will say my favorite book is a book. It's a children's book. And it's a book I grew up with called The Little Prince, which now kind of has an international renown. But it's a very philosophical book. For example, for your listeners who aren't familiar, it's this little prince who lives on a very small planet. And a flock of birds flies by and he catches a ride and he flies to all these different planets. And for example, on one of the planets, he meets an alcoholic who's sitting behind a desk with a big bottle of wine. And he asks the alcoholic, well, why do you drink? And the alcoholic says, to forget, pour oublier. And then the little prince says, well, pour oublier quoi? To forget what? To forget that I drink. And isn't that so philosophical? Because alcoholics drink to forget their pain. And, and, but when you're a kid, you don't think about that. But I think it's a beautiful book for children and for adults. It's full of little philosophical moments and metaphors for life. And I don't know why, but something about French, just everything just sounds better in French. <laughs> <laughs> something so simple to forget. In English, it's like to forget. And then it's in French, it's, well, what you said, because I can't speak French. Uh, <laughs> now, what about films? What is a favorite of yours, something that you keep coming back to? You know, I have a strict policy. I don't watch movies twice. Wow. And I don't watch movies that don't have happy endings, mm-hmm. or at least I don't watch movies that have really bad endings. Mm-hmm. It's a strict policy, but is there a film that you've given, you, you've reconsidered this policy with? No. Wow. 
<laughs> you are very determined. You you are very very diligent with that. Um, but and with my with my son, I have to watch Minions over and over and over <laughs> and over. How do you but feel about that? That's actually quite enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite Minion? Oh, I can't remember their names. <laughs> Could you describe them? Um, they're like these. You don't, you don't have minions in Australia. Uh, we do. We do have minions. I mean, I mean, we don't have minions walking around, but we are no. aware of minions. It's these yellow. Yeah. Well, characters. Yeah. But could you describe which your favorite minion is? I don't remember, but I just think the voice. Since I speak several languages, yeah, you can tell that the voice, the the dialogue is pulled from lots of different languages mm. and they pick the most expressive words and I think they express emotions so well I mean even if they only have one eye and they don't really have legs they I think they're so emotionally expressive and endearing <laughs> and vulnerable and candid and guileless for the most part that's what I like about it my my, my son giggles which is lovely yeah, for sure. I feel like minions are these creatures where, because of the language, the made up language that they speak, um, you don't like, it doesn't matter what language you converse in and you can understand them really like pretty well. Um, so it's really, really interesting to watch. And um, I, how do you feel about people who find minions annoying? Um, I can't imagine, <laughs> but, you know, like here in California, we have a lot of deer growing up in Paris. There were no deer. I love deer. There's a lot of people who think deer are annoying. They think they're like rats on legs. I think deer are just delightful. They're quiet. They're harmless. So, yeah. you know, it's for sure. I, I feel that with raccoons. Um, but I feel like that's probably only because we don't get raccoons in Australia. Um, whereas like people in the US are just like have this disdain towards raccoons because they dig into your trash, but from far, they are adorable. Yeah, they're, well, they're harmless. They're, they're, everybody's just trying to make a living, you know, they're just... Thank you. That's what I always say about raccoons. Oh, it's nice to feel... It's nice to feel in company with on, like on this topic, but um, before we get sidetracked, because I feel like we've gotten pretty sidetracked. Um, my last question for you before we end the section is who do you look up to the most in your professional life or your personal life? You know, I've had a lot of mentors over the years. Unfortunately, a lot of them have passed. <laughs> I mean, I could rattle off some names. David Schnarch, who wrote Passionate Marriage and the Sexual Crucible, which is over there on my bookcase. Um, um, gosh, Jim Maddock um, was a lovely, wise man who also passed. Um, you're catching me off guard with this question. <laughs> Um, Gabor Mate is still among the living. He's um, someone I look up to and whose work I, I admire and study. Um, a a Esther Perel is very popular. She and I are on the same wavelength about, we say a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've seen um, Esther Perel's, was it a card game? Um and I find it really interesting. I love the idea of like just the gamification of all sorts of things. Yeah, she's she has a lot of media. She has a lot of material out. Yeah, it's incredible um, being able to like materialize um, all of these mm -hmm. abstract concepts and ideas um, into something that can be used over and over again. Um, but what qualities in your role models do you find admirable wisdom and not buying into the predominant cultural model mm -hmm. 
so having an open, a more open mind. And so, for example, David Schnarch, you know, a more traditional approach to psychotherapy in America, at least the way I was trained in my master's program, is is not being all that direct and kind of like handing people a lot of Kleenex. And I am very direct in my approach. I'm, I'm confrontational in a collaborative way. I don't beat around the bush. I, I tell it like I see it. You're welcome to disagree with me. But it's a more lively engagement yeah. than traditional therapy. So a more confrontational style and yeah, so Esther Perel is is also from Europe, so she doesn't have that predominant American mindset. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thinking outside the box and thinking for yourself yeah. and inviting clients to think for themselves. Yeah, that's a great sentiment to have. And um, are these qualities um, what you try and try to embody in your practice as well? Most definitely, yes. I'm not. I'm not your typical therapist. That's great to hear. Um, now, I feel like we got to know you a bit better and it was lovely chatting with you about your personal life and the things that you like to consume. Um, now we're moving on to the interview section. And my first question for you is something that we like to ask all of our guests. Uh, we feel like this sets the baseline for the rest of the conversation. Um, and is it is, what is a relationship? How would you describe a relationship? Oh, gosh. It's whatever two people make it. You know, obviously, you can have any mix of genders and gender identities, you know. Um, and it can be two people. It can be three people. It can be in multiple configurations of couples. Um, there's some degree of commitment. Different people make different kinds of commitments to each other. Basically, for the most part... A, a relationship is between two people. Um, there's monogamy. Sometimes there isn't monogamy. There's some level of commitment to something. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, Most of the clients that I see are heterosexual, monogamous, mostly vanilla, though sometimes there's some kinky people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sort of your garden variety couples yeah and what is sexual desire what's what's your definition of it and how is it connected to relationships two minute video about this on my website but i will tell you my little soapbox talk about desire because i think there's a lot of misconception about desire that causes unnecessary suffering desire is the willingness to get started People confuse desire and arousal. So desire is the willingness to engage your partner sexually and see what's going to happen. And you can come to desire from three places. You can come to it from your crotch, that horny kind of throbbing loins kind of feeling. And guys have testosterone, so they have it going on in their crotch more than women do, typically, especially as women age. So you can come to it from your crotch. You can come to it from your heart. Gee, I really love this person. I feel really fond of them. I want to feel close to them. I want to connect them. I want to smell them, wrap my legs around them. Or you can come to it from your head. Like, gee, you know, it's been two days, two weeks, two months, two years, whatever. And it would be a good idea for us to get it on. It's the willingness to engage. And I tell people, it doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter if one person is 100% in their crotch and the other percent person is 50% in their heart and 50% in their head. It doesn't matter where you start. It's about getting started. And then the lubricating, the contorting, the heavy breathing, that is arousal. That's what happens when you get underway. So where people cause themselves unnecessary suffering is when they think, women in particular, they think, oh, he's got desire and I don't have desire because she's she doesn't have like spontaneous arousal because she doesn't have as much testosterone as he does. 
And so women often come in thinking they're broken because they don't have, what they don't have is arousal. So desire is the willingness to get started. And when I explain that to people, then they tend to find it very freeing and then they don't feel broken anymore. And they also have more understanding of how desire looks different in men and in women. And nobody's wrong and there's no right way to be about desire. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the way you put it was just so apt. Um, What are some examples of unhealthy attitudes towards that sexual desire? Well, uh, unhelpful attitudes are, so he gets turned on really quick. And so assuming a heterosexual model just for the sake of this conversation And so an unhealthy approach would be for her to have the expectation that she's going to get turned on as quickly as he is, or for him to expect her to get turned on as quickly as he is, which is probably not going to (laughs) happen. So that's just not helpful. Um, Also, to expect both people to have the same level of desire all the time. Like if he wants sex three times a week, for them both to expect that, you know, the other person is going to want sex three times a week. That's just not helpful and not realistic. And how would a couple's ability or inability to foster a healthy attitude towards sexual desire affect their relationship? Well, you know, what is it? Sex is 5% of the relationship when you're having it, when you're not having it, it's 95% of the relationship. And I'm just going to take issue with that word healthy because it's a word that gets used a lot, but I think we don't really think about what that means. And to me, a healthy amount of sexual desire is what's going to work for that couple, is what's going to work for both people. So I don't care if you're doing it twice a day or twice a year, whatever's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. So what was the beginning part of the question again? Um, How would a couple's ability or inability to foster, uh, what what should we use instead of healthy? Um, Just desire. Desire. Yeah, just skip the whole thing. How would a couple's ability or inability to foster sexual desire affect their relationship? I think it's critical. I think women in particular have a tendency to think that sex is not that important and they might prioritize security, emotional security, financial security, someone to have children with and take care, you know, raise children with. And women don't always put passion first. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's critical for a couple to have that initial connection because you don't have it with everybody. Some people have it and some people don't. And there's a lot of people who get together and build long-term relationships around weak or unsatisfactory desire and functional sex. So how you cultivate it is by making sure that you have it at the get-go. And I think you might have more questions about this, but um, emotional attunement, being emotionally attuned to each other and not just settling for a functional level of sex. Like the penis goes in the vagina, you wiggle it around a few times, somebody has an (laughs) orgasm, and you have the illusion that everything's fine. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people operate at that functional level of sex, which is going to get old and unsatisfying, and then at least one person is going to lose interest. So what would you recommend a couple doing in order to get past that functional level of sex? Personal growth, I think um, nothing supports eroticism like awareness, introspection, and accountability, and being willing to look at yourself and 
own your emotional blind spots and your behaviors that are less than optimal and own those in the presence of your mate Mm -hmm. that builds trust and builds credibility and also repair repair builds trust like do you want to be connected or do you want to be right so those are emotional tools that support eroticism in a relationship Mm -hmm. and there's two sort of practical physical not necessarily super sexy things that i think also maintain an erotic connection with your mate which is um holding each other belly to belly like maybe even like lift your shirt skin to skin belly to belly and that is part of like some people call it co-regulation. It's just holding each other and breathing together and feeling each other's energy. And if you feel into that, it's a lot easier to get from that to sex. Too many couples are anxious and disconnected, and then they come see me because they want to jump from anxiety to sex. And I'm like, wait, there's a lot of steps we got to cover before, you know, we get the penis in the vagina. It's like, that's not, you know, the be all end all. Mm -hmm. It's the emotional connection that needs to happen. And sometimes that was never there to begin with that needs to be built. Yeah. And sometimes the unsexiest acts or things can be just the most intimate. Yes. And, and, you know, couples with young kids, I see a lot of couples with young kids, you know, for him to, you know, do it out of laundry or do the dishes or get up in the middle of the night to change a diaper, that is going to go a long way. It's not sexy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I can vouch for that. (laughs) Like if my partner is picking up the slack and doing the dishes, I will be all over him after. I'm so sorry, TMI. Uh, <laughs> but it is true. It goes such a long way. And it's it's also just like, it's the emotional, conne- the emotional connection of like, you know, you, you it's, it's an act that shows your partner you're caring for them. Um, and the act itself, in and it of itself, might sound or look unsexy, but, you know, it's what, it's what's underneath that counts. Um, and yeah, it shows it's what that, it represents. That, it shows that they're paying attention. It shows that you are appreciated, that you are seen and paid attention to, and that you are valued. So many couples, you know, feel unappreciated by each other. And that is the death of sex. Yeah, for sure. And what role does communication play in this? Oh, communication. If I had a... I've been doing this for 30 years. If I had a dollar for every time, somebody said, we want, we need better communication. What I tell people is couples are always communicating. They just often don't like the communication they're getting. So I'll give you an example. You know, if somebody's sitting like this, they're communicating. Now I'm going to give you a more graphic example. If a couple... Again, assuming heterosexual, just for the sake of this conversation, because it makes it simpler. For example, if they're having sex rear entry or doggy style, some people call it, and she is really stiff and he is having to pull her towards him, she's communicating. If she's got her shoulders down on the bed, see, we've got everybody's attention who's listening right now. If she's got her shoulders down on the bed and she is going back to meet him, she's communicating. So the difference in communication in the first one, she's like, I'm not really into this. I'm feeling really tense and I'm not enjoying it. And you're not noticing that I'm not enjoying this. And you're just getting your rocks off. The second one where she's really into it and she's meeting him. She's like, I'm really enjoying this. And this feels really good. And I am meeting you. So that's an example of communication. People don't think about that as communication. So it sounds like from the example that you've given me that some people might not be the best at receiving communication and understanding what their partner's communicating to them. 
Do you have any advice for that? Well, when people are not receiving the communication they're getting, it's usually because somewhere in their life or in their childhood, they learned to ignore communication or the communication they were getting was so painful that they learned to not read the communication they're getting. They couldn't afford to get the communication. Those people who seem the most insensitive are actually those people who are so sensitive, they can't tolerate how much they're feeling. And so when somebody is not picking up their mate's communication, it's usually because somewhere along the line, they have learned to brush stuff under the carpet, not respond to communication. Um, yeah, so I'd say the short answer would be um, talk to a sex therapist. <laughs> it sounds like it kind of oil, all oil, all boils down to like what happened in your childhood and maybe not entirely, but just, you know, um, your childhood definitely affects you in some way as well. Um, so how would you approach helping individuals who have experienced trauma in the past um, foster, foster sexual desire in their relationship? Well, I'll start by commenting on your use of the word trauma and then I'll probably have you repeat the question because I'll have forgotten the end of it. So Gabo Mate, for example, says that trauma is not necessarily bad things that happen to you. Sometimes it's good things that should have happened that didn't. Mm -hmm. So for example, if your mother had postpartum depression and was not able to connect emotionally to the child, the infant did not get emotional attunement which is intolerable for an infant. And so maybe that's the trauma. So trauma is not always, you know, being molested or gang raped or neglected or, you know, there, there's plenty of that. But trauma is not always obvious. And so most of us have had some kind of trauma without being melodramatic. You know, there are experiences that shape us. <laughs> So that's my comment on trauma. So now, if you would mind repeat the second part of the question. Yes. Um, how do you approach helping individuals who have experienced trauma in um, fostering their sexual desire in their relationship? Well, the thing is that, you know, your, your comment a couple minutes ago about childhood and how much it shapes us is that we have these experiences in childhood and we make them mean something about us. And we take that into adulthood. And these faulty beliefs that we have about ourselves are making decisions for us. And they impact the people we choose to partner with. They impact how we show up sexually. They impact, um, if you have a faulty belief about how your needs don't matter, that's going to show up in bed. If you have a faulty belief about you'll never be heard, that's going to show up in bed. Mm -hmm. And so dealing with childhood traumas can help you make different decisions about your erotic expression in adulthood. Mm -hmm. So now apart from the belly to belly exercise that you've shared with us before. Are there any other exercises or activities that can help couples um, with exploring and understanding their desires or, or connecting sexually a bit better? Well, another one is eye gazing. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many couples come in for sex therapy, but then they don't want to do eye gazing. So I tell them, you know, just sit either with your legs wrapped around each other or in a chair across from each other or lay side by side facing each other and just gaze into each other's eyes without speaking for like two minutes or five minutes. You'd be amazed at how excruciating some people find that. There is a lot in the popular media about talk about your fantasies. 
you know, that's titillating, but I think everybody's entitled to have a secret garden. <laughs> and fantasies are called fantasies because they remain in your head and they are your personal um some people would call it a wank bank or you know whatever <laughs> or that term bank. recently <laughs> you know they are your personal um you know material yeah. that turns you on mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's something you want to act on mm -hmm. so it's important for couples to have conversations about what turns them on and what they like and what they don't like. But again, I it comes back a lot to reading, being emotionally attuned and being tuned in physically. So I had a client earlier today and she was telling me how her husband is not aware of her body language. So she might spell things out. You know, I like it when you do this. And then he might do it. I get this complaint so much. I told him what I like and he does it once and then he doesn't do it again. A lot of, I think this applies to men in particular, aren't used to tuning in to, like if a woman's breath catches or if she turns her head a certain way, you know, we're on a video, or if she's, you know, if she arches her back, or if she leans into him, or if she, if she moves a certain way that shows that she's opening, some guys don't pick that up. And I think they just haven't been trained. And I think it's a lucky man who comes across a woman who will train him to read those cues. So, it's important to have the conversations about whether or not you like to be tied up and, you know, whether or not you like to be spanked and whether or not you like anal sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, some stuff you're not just going to, you know, there's, you need to spell out. Mm -hmm. But the subtleties of the sexual interaction mm -hmm. tend to be unspoken. And are there any tools or resources for the for, for men who might want to learn and train themselves a bit more on these cues? You know, in San Francisco, which is, you said I'm near San Rafael, but I'm, I'm near San Francisco, same, same thing. You can't shake a stick without hitting some kind of hands-on sexual workshop. Um, and there's probably a lot of stuff online. I can't recommend any in particular, but there is a lot available now with the internet. It's it's mind-boggling how much is available and how many people are out there saying that they are sex therapists. Mm -hmm. um, it's an unregulated field, so you don't have to have a master's and a PhD and 30 years experience. You can just have a weekend course in, you know, some kind of hands-on sexual work, somatic work. And, and claim to be a sex therapist. So there's a lot of material out there for people who want more hands-on training. Mm -hmm. And these resources that are available, that's so readily available online, um, are there any misconceptions floating about in there or anything like disinformation or misinformation that people have to look out for? I think there's there's some misinformation about Tantra. So I'm not knocking Tantra. It has a place. But people think Tantra is going to be the Holy Grail and the answer to all their prayers. And they're going to do a weekend Tantra workshop and it's going to fix everything. It's not. There's also Eastern and Western Tantra. I am not versed enough in it to be able to comment competently. What is Tantra? Um, it's a, the part of it that is most useful is is kind of what I was touching on earlier with co-regulating. It's it's matching your breathing. It's aligning your chakras. It's opening up your energy. It's um, being attuned to someone. It gets more complex, and again, I. I've done workshops on it, but I don't remember, and I'm not an expert on that. So I think the misconceptions are that 
There's also misconceptions about surrogates. You know, people think they're going to, you know, pay their money and hop on and hop off and they'll be fixed. And it doesn't work that way. A lot when you work with a surrogate, a lot of what you do is learn how to interact with somebody and learn how to relate to somebody. So I think the misconceptions are that sex is about doing. So often people say, oh, it's a doc, you know, what do I do? And I say, well, you know, guys in particular, want guys want to fix. You know, it's a lovely trait, but it's not a doing thing. It's a being thing. It's how you be with yourself and with your mate. It's how you show up. That is so aptly put. Um, and what do you, how important do you think self-care and self-compassion are in maintaining a positive relationship with sex? I think it's critical being compassionate with yourself about your emotional state of mind or how you feel about your body. You know, maybe your butt is more jiggly than it used to be and gravity's kicked in and having self-acceptance and um, self-care is critical. It's like, you know, the oxygen mask on the plane. You know, if you don't put on your own oxygen mask, you can't show up for anybody else. It's the same. If you're not taking care of yourself, you can't really be present with your beloved. And, you know, part of the reason I exercise six days a week is it's a huge part of my self-care. It, it's, I kind of say, you know, it's good for my noggin, but it keeps me grounded it keeps me in my body. It gets me out of my head. I feel empowered. I feel f I am fit. My body can do pretty much what I want it to do, you know, within reason. Um, Self-care, having quiet time to yourself, eating a healthy diet. You know, people who have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or they have gas, or they have an unhealthy diet because they eat too much gluten, or they're allergic to dairy, and then they're bloated and they don't feel sexy. You know, if you're not taking care of your body and your mindset, it's going to really get in the way of your sexual expression. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it reminds me of this one time. So I have a friend who has who is lactose intolerant. And when she told me this story, I just... I didn't know what to say, but um, so essentially she was seeing this guy for like a week or something like that. And the f the second time I think she slept over at his place, uh, she was getting all the runs from, from eating dairy um, <laughs> and had to go to the bathroom so many times. But they had sex like four times in that night. And, she, and he had no idea what was going on. <laughs> well, that was a new relationship. So he yeah, probably, probably wasn't aware. Just thought, oh, this girl goes to the bathroom yeah, a lot. Yeah, probably. And she was probably like, well, I don't want to bring this up. It's just going to kill the vibes. Yes. So, <laughs> but that's just um, quite funny to me. Um, how different people take these things um and thank you so much for sharing with us all your insights um about sex desi sexual desire now we're moving on to the open mic section and this is your opportunity to talk about anything that you're passionate about um so the floor is yours take it away well i can think of several things i'm passionate about and i think one of them is Everything in moderation, which is sort of a French motto for life and ties in with your question about self-care. Champagne in moderation, you know, chocolate and foie gras in moderation, exercise in moderation, sleep in moderation, everything in moderation, balance, having a balanced life and not overdoing anything but giving yourself permission to indulge in things that are pleasurable. So that, I think, is a very French mindset mm -hmm. that is key to quality of life. Mm -hmm. So that, I'm, I'm, I live that. 
Another thing I'm pretty passionate about is is something that I call erotic integrity. So I wrote a book about it. Um, and erotic integrity, you know, for years people said, oh, you have such an interesting job, you know, you should write a book. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, people have been having sex for a long time. I haven't invented anything. If I come up with something new, you know, maybe I'll write a book. And then over the years I realized that I do have this lens of erotic integrity and I had written articles about it and then I trademarked it because when every client comes in, I may never even use these words, but I am looking at who are they really? Because a lot of suffering comes from people trying to put a square peg in a round hole. People think they're supposed to be a certain way. And there's a lot more variety to human sexuality than people would allow themselves to believe. And erotic integrity is about understanding who you are really. Maybe you're more bisexual than you realize, but you never gave yourself permission. Maybe you have this thing that turns you on, but you're not really comfortable with it. Maybe you have a much higher libido than you think is permissible in your relationship or in your life or in your culture. And so I help people unpack and really examine, like, what really turns you on? And then I have them own that, sort of accept that about themselves. And, and then we look at how is that going to fit into your life? and into your authentic erotic expression. So there's three steps to erotic integrity, but that's basically what it is. It's like really helping people figure out who they are, own it, and live it authentically. Because I have found over the 30 years I've been doing this, and I wrote the book uh, maybe nine, 10 years ago, um, that that releases people from feeling broken, from trying to be the way that they think they're supposed to be. And it just brings a lot more um, fullness of expression and a lot more joy. And I've always said that, you know, erotic integrity is not just about how you show up between the sheets. It's about how you show up in the world. Because when you own who you are and you're comfortable with who you are, it impacts how you show up in the world. And it impacts how you show up in your friendships and in your work and with your family, even, you know, even in non-erotic relationships. So, yeah, I'm pretty passionate about authenticity and embracing people's authentic erotic expression, whatever that is going to look like. Yeah, I agree. And your book sounds incredibly helpful for a lot of people out there. I I myself know that, um, so I'm from Singapore and I have a lot of friends who, um, because of how they, like the, the environment they brought up in, they never felt like they could allow themselves to feel a certain way. Um, so it's really interesting how lots of people just, um, you know, only start discovering themselves, um, their authentic selves, um, very, very far into life. And it sounds like your book could be really helpful with that. Um, so Claudia, where can people find your book? You can get it on Amazon. You'll probably get a better price. Or actually, there's a link on my website, dr6.net. One of the tabs is to the book. There's all the reviews. It won like different eight different awards. It got a great Kirkus review, which is like the gospel of reviews. And there's a link there to Amazon. So if you want to find out about the book, you go to the book tab on my website and and then you order it on Amazon. Um, All right. Yeah, amazing. I would say. And if our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do or keep up with you online, where can they go? Go to my website, dr6.net, D-R-S-I-X.net. <laughs> and on the homepage, there's my TED Talk. I did a TED Talk about performance anxiety in women. 10-minute uh, TED Talk, which is people tend to find very useful and liberating 
it ties in with what we were talking about desire earlier. Yeah, everything about me is, right, is on that website. We'll link those in the show notes. Thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope you learned a bit about sexual desire and we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Veloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Live Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at re.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.